When it comes to children, my only gripe with the backlash against the trans agenda is that it's not going far enough. Even so, I am glad to see that we, what we were discussing on the sofa in 2015 is now mainstream talk even on the New York Times, a former newspaper. Definitely a form of progress. However, when it comes to adults and late teenagers, which to us in the global non-Anglo majority are also basically adults, I changed my mind. Until about three years ago, I held the position that when it comes to children, a much stronger backlash is needed, coupled with rigid policies and, if necessary, state enforcement as well. But when it comes to adults, they should just be left alone. Their bodies, their choice, none of my problem, all of that. Well, I changed my mind on the latter. Now, I believe that when it comes to adults and late teens, we should consider actively supporting them for strategic reasons and as a means to an end. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Ok, so I was mulling this video for several months already, as our members of the donor circle are fully aware, but I kept on postponing it because I wanted to film it with a trans flag behind me. Unfortunately, I live in a, such a far-right country that you can't find one to buy. That's a, there's a single supplier that promises to deliver it in two months and, well, I'm rarely for two months in the same place, so I have no idea whether this green screen and this editor is good enough to put a trans flag behind me, behind me and that it doesn't look awful, or at least put it in its entirety. If not, I'll just put a small one here. I'll try. Though I admit that the very idea is wrong, because the trans flag always looks awful. But that's besides the point. So. I said in the intro that there's a good reason to support the trans when it comes to adults and late teenagers for strategic reasons and as a means to an end. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, I admit this is a difficult proposition and a tough balance, but I also believe it's worth it. So, what I'm saying is that we should separate the so-called health argument, which is entirely insane and anti-scientific from, uh, uh, right from the get-go, and separate that from the sociological argument. When it comes to the pseudoscience behind the trans madness, the backlash will naturally run its course. There will be lawsuits and eventually this madness will be made illegal. Maybe even some of these doctor grifters will go to jail, who knows. But until that happens, there is a window of about 10 years when the debates will continue. And I propose we take the pro-trans side now, as said for strategic reasons, but what I really mean is for vengeful reasons. You see, the primary goal that I'm pursuing is the restoration of the freedom of association. The foundation of freedom of association is the right to exclude, first and foremost. Because unlike, uh, j just like any other liberty, this is a negative right. And way too many countries of this world lost that primarily on the altar of the inclusion of women. When was the last time you saw a men-only gym? or a boys-only scholarship, or a boys-only summer camp, or an apartment block that rents out exclusively to single men, or indeed a professional locker room for sportsmen that is free of women. Depending on where you live, your response to these questions may vary from 10 years to never. So let me give you examples, because this is best illustrated through examples. May 2023, the BBC, women-only tower block given go-ahead by Ealing Council. Quote, Plans for a 15-storey women-only tower block in West London have been given the green light. Ealing Council approved the application, which will see 102 new flats built from the uh, Women's Pioneer Housing Association. The new flats will provide low-rent accommodation to single women only, unquote. Now, can you imagine something like this ever being approved for men? No? Then here's why I will gladly support any action that aims to undermine the very existence of this project. 
Luckily, the trans agenda is a great vehicle for this because it also says, quote, according to WPA policy, any woman female at birth or has a, quote, gender recognition certificate leg legally declaring them female, unquote, as well as transgender women who intend to undergo, are undergoing or have undergone gender reassignment and non-binary people who meet the aforementioned criteria can join the public waiting list, unquote. As far as I'm concerned, men should get as many of these self-ID certificates as they can, since that has become very easy in Britain, and just apply and fill in the entirety of the waiting list. Homeless charities should help the overwhelmingly male majority of the homeless population to use this shortcut as well. I hope I will be able to convince some relevant parties to at least try this. And use the same solis solipsistic logic against them as well. Quote, WPA, who currently own more than a thousand properties across London, say it is vital to provide women with affordable, high-quality housing. In their annual report, the Housing Association said that there is no region in England where a single woman on an average woman's salary can afford to rent a private sector home of her own, unquote. Well, there is no region in England where a single man on an average man's salary can afford to rent a private sector home of his own either. In a normal world, both would be permitted. But since men-only housing is not permitted, the best course of action is to undermine this project to the fullest extent permissible by the administrative law. See my previous video on that. How about locker rooms? We get to, to hear lately a lot of whining from women's groups about men who think they're women and are in their locker rooms. Cry me a river. Women fought hard and aggressively and won the right to be in men's locker rooms. This happened over 45 years ago and the permanent jurisprudence is still in force. So why exactly should I care now that finally the consequences of female solipsism are rigorously enforced upon women who applauded like mindless seals for so many decades? Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, September 2018. 40 years after winning the right to report from men's locker rooms, Melissa Lutke still sees work to be done. Men felt enormously threatened by even the presence of one woman among them. Unquote. Are we clear? Yes, yes, I'm aware of the equally solipsistic argument that this case was different because, you see, her opportunities as a journalist were denied. Well, I don't care. Men's opportunities were denied too, when female-only spaces had remained unpenetrated, no pun intended, while men-only spaces had been made illegal. So far, I brought this case up to exactly 143 women. Out of those, exactly two agreed with me that such a ruling was indeed immoral and indeed one of the many causes of the current madness. Both were non-Anglo, which also tells me that this is an Anglo problem in addition to being a female solipsism problem. The other 141 simply sought multiple excuses for why fighting to be in men's locker room as a woman is kosher, but somehow our trans sisters doing exactly the same thing and using the exact same jurisprudence that weakened the rigidity of single-sex spaces is somehow haram. Well, with all due respect, please, kindly, go fuck yourselves. This is one issue I'm simply not willing to let go, basically ever. And most definitely, I'm not willing to tolerate pseudo-arguments that rely on special pleading. Either inclusivity at all costs is bad, as I happen to believe, in which case, freedom of association must prevail, which means all female journalists fuck off from men's locker rooms, or... Inclusivity is good, in which case it's a great spectacle of equality and inclusion that boys are finally playing in women's sports. You can't have both, and you won't have both. And if I can't have it my way, then it will be my pleasure to contribute in my small ways to reducing women-only spaces to the same level as men-only spaces. That is to say, make them illegal by forcing them to be inclusive at all costs. Now, is that damaging? Yes! But I'll start to pretend to care when you will start caring about just how damaging forced inclusivity is for men. 
And I will start caring for real when I see you working to restore men-only spaces and freedom of association, not a single second earlier. I'm done with this passive support in the form of, oh yeah, well, you do have a point. No, no, no. Nope, not this time. Only real work in the real world with real and tangible results will count. Until then, I am glad that women's sports are being destroyed by our trans sisters. Speaking of women's sports, this is not a change of attitude on my part. As early as July 2015, I mocked women's sports on this channel, not because I necessarily despise women's sports, but because women's sports as a professional endeavor is effectively a tax on men. With the exception of beach volleyball, all women's sports is partially subsidized by the taxpayers, that is to say men, or by literally taxing men's disciplines to keep women's pay somewhat competitive. And in 2015, women's national football squad in the USA came up with the idea that all of this is actually not enough. What they wanted was equal pay with men, even though they produced less than a tenth of the financial value that men's football does. And in 2022, they succeeded. Well, if that's the case, then I fully do support men joining women's teams en masse until all women's football is just men. Hey, men are paying for it anyway, so why shouldn't men benefit from what they're paying for? In Britain, they're even more honest about this. The Guardian, January 2023, quote, Players for Wales men's and women's football teams will be paid the same for playing for their country after a deal was struck by Wales' governing body. The agreement with the Football Association of Wales comes into effect uh, immediately and will cover up to the, to the 2026 FIFA Men's World Cup and the Women's Tournament a year later. It will mean a 25% pay cut for the men's team to enable a rise of the same amount for the women's side." Unquote. Now, Wales is not a global force in football, but even those who never watched football have likely heard of Gareth Bale, just like people who never watch football have likely heard of Gheorghe Hagi. But not even seasoned football buffs can name a player from Wales's women team off the top of their heads, and for good reason. Women's football is distinctly inferior in every single respect, including and especially financially and claiming otherwise is simply a lie. But nevertheless, by and large, women applauded like seals for measures like these. I have scoured the internet for at least a single woman saying that this measure is morally reprehensible, financially unsound, and all around wrong. Silence is consent, ladies. I didn't make the rules, I just got here. You made the rules, and I hope more people like me start deciding to forcibly shove them down your throats by any means necessary. You see, there is a phrase in Romanian that doesn't quite translate well into English. Something along the lines of, I'll give you inclusivity until it bursts through your nose. This must be the framework, in my opinion. In the jurisdictions where the so-called self-ID laws were passed, Teenagers and adult men should just say they're women and barge in. In the meantime, in propaganda, we should minimize the impact all the time, rigorously call the opposition bigots and close-minded rubes, and all steadily until all women-only scholarships are taken by men. And until all, or nearly all, women's sports is also men. Ideally, this charade gets stopped somewhere down the road by an admission that all of this is crazy and we start the conversation about single-sex spaces. But if that doesn't happen, and I'm not ruling it at all because people's stupidity is the only limitless thing in this universe, then we should just march on until every single female-only space is de facto majority men or at least co-ed. Why? Because women absolutely deserve it. That's why. I was offered this excuse that, oh well, 16-year-old girls can't be held accountable for court decisions made 40 years ago. Oh really? Members of the Parliament of the United Kingdom blame white Polish men for things done allegedly by British men in the 1700s. If men can take the heat, so can women. And if women can't take the heat from being subjected to this standard, then what can I say? Tough luck. I'm out a fucks to give. But. Even if 
we grant this argument. I don't. But even if we grant this argument, this conversation is not just about decisions made 40 or 50 years ago. I just gave three examples from 2022 and 2023. Here's another one from 23. July 23, Metro Weekly, Florida Gay Nude Resort Can't Ban Women Judge Rules. Uh-oh. By the way, this was achieved via administrative lawfare. That's why it's so important to learn how to do it if you can. The only people who objected to this were a few homosexuals here and there, and that's it. Women who are so concerned with the gender cult just pretended that this piece of news doesn't exist. And speaking of the gender cult, the issue is not new at all. Again, I recommend to y'all the series called Yarnevask or Brainwash made by the Norwegian state television 14 years ago, in fact filmed 15 years ago. Episodes 1, 3 and I believe 5 of that series go through this issue at length. Now, of course, I could recommend more radical stuff, but that series is great because you can show it to your normie friends. Enerco is not some far-right conspiracist blog, but one of the most left-wing TV stations on the planet. And the documentarian is a lefty comedian, too, with a degree in sociology. You can't get more normie mainstream than that. And in that series, again, published 14 years ago, before Tumblr, before smartphones, before social media the way we know it today, you will get to learn that the experiments on transing children have been around for a lot longer than 2017. Yet, for as long as it affected primarily boys, nobody gave a shit. Now, we're supposed to be very concerned because for a short little while, a blip in history is affecting girls slightly. Oh no, the humanity. Give me a freaking break, will ya? If we're gonna tackle this issue, then it's either going to have to be through reason or it's not going to be at all. The current approach is through unreason, in my opinion because it's female-centric. And you will excuse me if I genuinely not only don't care about women's problems, but I am in fact very glad for some of them, because they are in the direct result of women's voting patterns and manifested or revealed preferences. Women voted for all of this shit, overwhelmingly so, and they still do. So, if you're a man watching this, you must refuse the current framing and the shaming that comes from primarily lesbians uh, and women of special psychiatric needs that try to appeal to your alleged protector nature. No. Women wanted this. And the best way to convince them that it's wrong is the same best way as with everyone else. Give them exactly what they wanted in full. No discounts, no exceptions, no refunds. One more example and then we can wrap this up. This one ties into another special pleading that women routinely engage in. And yes, I say women, not just feminists. CNN, April 2012. Uh, let women into the Augusta Golf Club. Well, well, the boys at Augusta National Golf Club, members and sponsors alike, are in a big bind. Nine years later, after I uh, uh, led an unsuccessful effort by, effort by the National Council of Women's Organizations, to open the membership in the club to women, the woman problem is back. This time it involves Virginia Romity, the first female chief executive of IBM. IBM is a major sponsor of Augusta National's uh, Master Golf Tournament, and up to now its CEO have always been given membership in the club, but none has ever been a woman. So what happens now? Will Augusta National open its doors to women, or will IBM pull its sponsorship and force its other executives to resign their club memberships? These are the only two choices. Uh, we've uh, said all along that this is not about golf. It is about access to the places where big business is done. Deals are made and careers are bo boosted or broken. Half of Augusta's membership, which reads like a roaster of Fortune 500 CEOs, probably doesn't even care about golf. But the members do care about power relationships. According to Future Magazine, golf remains the true communications hub of America's business elite. Unquote. This is another type of special pleading that is coming back these days when people like me make the argument that I just made, namely that women-only spaces should be permitted to exist only to the extent that men-only spaces are permitted to exist and not a single inch more. The special pleading sounds as follows. It's not about the golf, it's about power. And if it's a place where business is made, then women should be included. And very few are willing to respond correctly to this. And the correct response is no. 
No, you are not entitled to be included on my property among my chosen friends in our spare time. Deal with it. There is no moral difference on whether the combined net worth of the male-only club is $5 or $500 billion. It's still an exclusivist male-only club from which the vast majority of men are excluded as well. It's called life. But since women didn't want to accept uh, life's facts, then why should we accept the framework that actively and relentlessly excludes men's freedoms? We don't have to. And the tools are there in administrative law for anyone to use. The fact that more men are still not using them is a problem to be solved by teaching, especially young men, to exploit every single legal female-only accommodation for their personal benefit and to do so mercilessly and indeed with pride. Now, on a slightly more serious note, and by that I don't mean that I wasn't serious so far, but I also did emphasize the points a bit harsher than I believe them, because that's how you negotiate. You don't go to the negotiation by asking for what you want, because you'll get less than a tenth of what you want. That's, this is what men always did in sexual politics, and that was obviously wrong. What you do is ask ten times more than what you want, in the hope that you get most of what you really wanted, and maybe even a bit extra. So. On that note, I'll say this. Every single disruptive action must be supported, encouraged, and replicated. So, for instance, in July 2015, I was saying about Norway's self-ID law that it should be exploited to either clog the bureaucracy or to create as many clown situations as possible. I was very glad to read that in 2023, a young man did exactly that. He legally changed his gender to female using a very liberal self-ID law to get two extra points for being female and thus getting into a highly competitive engineering program. Link in the description. Now, this young man was willing to talk publicly about it, but he wasn't the only one who did it last year. <laughs> Several dozens did, and that is a very good thing. Even better it would be if a lot more would do it, uh, and all of the gender points, because that's what they're called in Norway, I wish I were joking, but more young men should do this and rack up all of those gender points, and they should attack female-only scholarships as well until they get them all. The short-term objective should be creating chaos for chaos' sake, while also reaping some individual immediate benefits. But the longer-term objective should be to force a choice in society. We either believe in fundamental rights or in equality. It's really that simple. And women should absolutely be pushed to suffer as much as possible from the equality, because that's the only way at least some women will be convinced to stop voting for it. You have to remember, women never really suffered the consequences of their votes. And as Milton Friedman correctly taught us over 50 years ago, you can't convince someone that they're wrong as long as their paycheck depends on them staying wrong. So what I'm saying is, take away the paychecks. Heck, I really don't understand why there aren't millions of white American men who explicitly identify as black lesbians. Why not? Because it's dishonorable? <laughs> well, <coughs> I suppose... I suppose it is your choice to be stomped out of existence honorably, but those with two brain cells to rub together should absolutely investigate on how to use the system explicitly for their own benefit and the benefit of their fellow man. And here, yes, I mean man as adult human male. Because women do, in 75 to 80% of the cases, function unapologetically with a female in-group bias. This is not controversial. It's been studied for over a hundred years, and not a single attempt at disproving it has been successful. The range of bias var varies across studies. The most optimistic say it's 60% of women who have an in-group bias, while the most realistic say it's a bit over 80%. But they all agree that men have a very low in-group bias. This is not an immutable thing, it's mostly a choice. Women could choose to be less misandrist, but since they refuse, it is your fault as a man if you refuse to be more androcentric. Hey, I didn't make the rules. I just got here. Ultimately, 
The window for this debate will last about a decade more. It will be gone from public attention by 2035-2036 at the latest. Why? Because eventually the lawsuits will reach maturity, the so-called gender clinics will be shut down one by one, and eventually the whole craze will be regarded with the same odd looks like we look at the satanic panics of the 1990s. However, just like some good things came out of the satanic panics, like some reforms in the child abuse legislation that diminished the amount of false prosecutions, some good things can come out from this craze as well. So, for these reasons, I propose to you a low-key, limited support for the trans agenda. Limited in the sense that only the sociological claims should be upheld, like um, how the chap in Norway did, or the Swiss chap who legally changed his gender ID to get earlier retirement. Again, these are men that did nothing to their bodies, they just successfully gamed the system. Good stuff. Such things should be openly encouraged and replicated wherever it is possible. Ergo, why you should learn administrative lawfare. Basically, what I am proposing sounds pretty close to the old understanding of the term transmaxing. Now, unfortunately, that term has been co-opted by another group, but I will leave uh, an extensive definition in the description for you to read. So, okay, let's not call it transmaxing because it's politically inconvenient. Let's just call it the restoration project. And I insist on the word project, because projects, unlike movements, have an expiration date and limiting principles. The limiting principle here should be the restoration of sane approaches to freedom of association. And I say restoration, not just conversation. Even if the tone of the conversation improves, which it might, but it will take a few more years, I just say that that's not enough. What will be enough is a reversal of most, preferably all, so-called civil rights rulings. Bring back male-only gyms, boys-only summer camps, boys-only schools, absolute right to select clientele to private clubs, either get rid of sex-based scholarships altogether, that would be my preference, or if that's not possible, then absolute parity for them is the bare minimum. And then, and only then, we can have a conversation about the limits. And I do expect during the conversation to get even more concessions. If not, then the status quo should continue, with men increasingly refusing even the very idea of negotiating. Go, go, Troons! Give them hell, Trian Trans sisters! <laughs> so, <coughs> basically, what I am proposing is to help shorten the conflict by intentionally augmenting the level of chaos. I'm open to discussion and persuasion, but I will only take non-emotional arguments into consideration, and only arguments that don't start from a gynocentric point of view. I don't care how my position makes you feel, or how this affects you as a woman, or your daughter, or your female relatives. I have young female relatives too, and they've been warned. You either play nice with reality or consequences. The worst possible response to the current opportunity is to continue to shield women from the consequences of their own collective choices. It's by far the worst option. All other options are inherently superior. And, as usual, mainstream conservatives uh, instinctively jump for the worst option, which is why they are also deserve to lose elections, be obliterated from public culture, and continue to be the far left's bitch. And it's also why I'm not interested in the mainstream conservative argument any more than I'm interested in the mainstream leftist argument. What I'm interested in is the strategically superior approach. When it comes to children, that is slowly happening, and I'm glad it is. And I'm also glad that most people are on board with it, and I'm glad that mainstream conservatives fought hard to bring it forth and convinced normies as well. All credit where it's due. But when it comes to late teens and adults, I believe that the mainstream conservative approach is not just wrong, but the worst possible option, and indeed an option that is morally wrong. So yeah. In short, unless you're willing to discuss and implement curtailing inclusivity for real, which yes, will mean some women will lose some of their current privileges, then I'm all for our trans sisters ruining every single female-only space from prisons to domestic violence shelters, sports, academic scholarship, you name it. In both cases, we get equality. One is negative, as in negative rights, 
and one is positive. Positivism is the status quo, and unless you're willing to work to change that, I'm simply not interested in how the unfortunate consequences of female-desired and female-voted positivism finally affects women a little bit. Wah! Cry harder, don't give a shit. So yeah, I'm open to persuasion, but by reason and real fairness, not emotion and special pleading. And with all of that being said, thank you all for watching, thank you for your continuous and generous support, send me to the cartels, and I will see you all soon on the Freedom Alternative.